Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we'll bring you day 565 of Russian invasion into Ukraine. As always, with former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel Alexei Rostovich, and in this format with Nikolai Feldman and Yuri Romanenko from Alpha and Omega Media Channel. Today, thanks go to our new members. Welcome, Clever Pittsburgh, Anya Kuchta, and Grisha, and of course, thank you, Bill, for your super thanks. Much appreciated. With this, let's go into day 565. Enjoy. Hello everybody, this is Project Alpha, my name is Nikolai Feldman, you're watching Ukraine War Diaries with Alexei Rostovich and it is being streamed live on Alexei's channel and uh, on channel of Yuri Romanenko as well and here at Alpha and Omega. And of course if you're listening or watching that in English then uh, you're watching it at the Privateer Station channel, do not forget to click like and subscribe. Good evening Alexei, good evening Yuri. Let's start with one of the main news. Putin and Kim Chen In will have a chance to meet in Russia on the 13th of September. Alexei was commenting on that uh, probability and uh, outcomes to another interviewer uh, at Golovanov's channel. And even back then, Alexei mentioned that this meeting can affect a serious influence over the flow of war. Alexei, so the mic is yours. I did not really say, Nikolai, that it was the, the serious influence. I said it will be somewhat serious, but not uh, really that much. The main question is whether North Korea will start supplying military equipment to Russia and the uh, Department of State of the United States already sent a message to not do that. And of course, we understand that if the meeting happens on the highest level, then likely they will start providing some military support. Can they arm 100, 200, 300,000 of Russian soldiers? I have big concerns. I am also thinking that China likely is not a good supplier of military. China is also getting ready and accumulating some resources for potential conflict in there vicinity, but uh, will they be able to provide and will they even step to provide much support to Russia? I doubt that. What happens if North Korea supplies 2 million shells? Is it small supply? Is it a lot? It's quite a lot. We'll definitely feel that on the front because we'll have to destroy the artillery systems and it will be more casualties on our side, of course. But at the same time, if uh, North Korea still goes for military support to Russia, they'll have to suffer consequences of that. And probably South Korea will also take part, more active part in this conflict. There is probably also a Chinese game here happening, because that uh, new suggestion at G20 by United States to create a new Silk Road, so to say, avoiding Chinese Silk Road project, which they bet so much on, 70% uh, of the world trade is uh, ocean trade, ocean vessels, but uh, China is trying to get uh, the remaining 30% under itself. And America was suggesting a new 30-year-old program, 30-year program of cooperation for decades to come, uh, for goods to go via India, Arab countries, and then uh, into Europe and or United States. And by the way, leader of China did not go to G20 as we know, so probably he was aware of uh, this probable suggestion by United States, and I think they may be playing their own game and reacting to that economic development in their own way. And uh, Ukraine is one of the fronts where they are trying to express their upset about uh, new politics of uh, United States and these new initiatives. So how long do 2 million shells uh, will we'll carry them through? What will be the time frame for that to be used? It'll 
be enough for probably a year. But there is another aspect here that we are actively destroying the artillery. So when we actually spend a HIMARS on a single artillery system on the Russian side, it actually tells you that this is one of the main targets that we have right now. And they already have some Chinese shells on the front. Korean we haven't seen yet. I think though that Chinese are probably ones being supplied via Korea as well. Because they're likely grey shipments, they're not official. But there are some testing shipments that we actually see here, uh, some of the Chinese shells being used. So, on other side, I'm listening to serious people who do front analytics as well and discuss some questions with them. So they're also outlining an interesting aspect that early in the war, when on Donetsk and Papasna, in the areas of main attack, they had a 1 to 10 advantage over our artillery systems. And norm was at least 1 to 5 and everywhere else. And right now, uh, this parity is about 1 to 1. So we have destroyed a huge number of the artillery systems. And just with shells, you cannot change the flow here. They'll have enough supplies, but it doesn't really change the picture much. And if we're talking about supplying artillery systems, that's a much more difficult and complex decision, because you'll need to train personnel, and also it is uh, going to be visible. And we understand that if they go this route, then it will become visible, and the West will likely supply us with uh, larger numbers of equipment that will help us to solve the same problem in the new circumstances. So, I'll interrupt you here, Alexei. Remember, you mentioned that it'll probably turn into some proxy war between two Koreas on this front, if uh, North Korea starts to supply their uh, military items. Do you think they can even afford themselves to get dragged into this war? Well, Nikolai, as any socialist country, North Korea lies a lot, so nobody knows the exact numbers of their shells and artillery systems available, including for export. But the fact that North Korea is uh, in conflict with South Korea, and South Korea is one of the most advanced military suppliers in the world, they're one of the seven, I think, countries who have the whole cycle of military production, uh, which means all types of military equipment are being manufactured in uh, South Korea, and they have a ton of uh, different systems available. Just uh, M109 type howitzers, they have 1600s in the warehouses in conservation. If we get 300 of those, let's say, we'll destroy the front line on the Russian side for 20 kilometers length throughout the front line if we want to. So, before we jump into another one, I have another question here. Hang on, Nikolai. So, we see that Russia is trying to get more allies in the uh, faces of China, North Korea, but at the same time, Ukraine is also trying to acquire new allies. And there was an interesting questionnaire data published today, Eurostat published. I think these are generally positive outcome. More than 50% of European citizens support continuing aid to Ukraine and sanctions against Russia. 57% think that European Union need to continue supply military equipment and continue training Ukrainian military. Over 50% continue are for continuation of humanitarian support and 70% are eager to continue accepting refugees and over two-thirds think that European Union needs to support integration of Ukraine into their systems. So, on the backdrop of the United States, where there are some isolationism ideas, have uh, popularity in European Union, this large support remains on a high level. Right, this is to answer the question whether they are tired from war or not. They are not. I agree with your statement, Alexei. They're, they're not. And there was another piece of news today that those 250 billion dollars that are arrested of Russian assets, European Union adopted some legal base that now they can tax the proceeds of these uh, 
monies that are arrested or assets that are arrested on their territories. So not only they are not tired, they're actually starting to find ways to get some money from arrested assets. And by the way, one, one of the other angles on that, especially in America, they were talking about that, saying that this is one of the mo best investments uh, that we were doing recently, um, meaning destroying Russian military capacity and uh, all the benefits that it brings to the world. It definitely is a good investment of their money. And Europeans also understand that just fine, that Ukraine is uh, the country stopping that uh, negative Russian influence and destroying Russian war fighting capacity right now. And there is a special program in the European Union that was adopted in the EU for manufacturing of military shells, uh, of uh, artillery shells. And the, their main message was to make sure they can provide a million artillery shells to Ukraine in a year. And uh, it does include uh, shells for uh, Jeopard systems and the others. So for every North Korea, there'll be quite a few Germanys and Swedens and Sweden's right, because Sweden already came out today and said that they will manufacture a thousand APC carriers for Ukraine. SV-90 is a great machine for its class, it's fantastic. Uh, Hanna Mahler said this is the best one. Well, yeah, if you look at some parameters, it's one of the best. Uh, for, for the balanced uh, approach, armor, speed and versatility, this is a very good vehicle and it covers a lot of uh, issues on the front. On the old Soviet equipment that we had, it's much worse, especially in the matter of survivability of the crew, and uh, this is a key element for us. We don't have that many people as Russia, so we do care about our people surviving attacks. These APCs are better. Let's go to other news, and some publications outline that today we have 420,000 of uh, Russian troops on the front in Ukraine. And maybe this is not a right question, but Alexei, can you indicate where most of these 420 are? Let's do some math here. Let's take 420,000 for 1.3 thousand kilometers of the front. So you get 323. This is half a battalion for a kilometer. Especially given some geography, this is not too great of a density. In the city agglomeration, the density has to be higher as well. And uh, from the beginning, this is not enough troops to even solve the matters they put in front of them. And they need to understand, one needs to understand that these numbers include ever, everything, not uh, just the battle for ready front line. It also includes Russian guard, it includes, uh, that actually does uh, police support in the you know, behind the front lines on, on their occupied territories. And very few of them are really battle ready. The rest are not even fighting their logistics and other personnel. People who know what they are doing, military professionals from the beginning, were saying that from the beginning of this war, they didn't have enough. And even on the south right now, they don't have enough density in order to hold and change the front uh, and change the war outcome there. By the way, near Rabotina, we finally controlling the road between Novoprakopovka and Verbavoya, which gives a lot of trouble to Russian troops. See, uh, there are two groups. One is on the left, near Novoprakopovka, there are four diamonds, and Verbavoya is on the right of uh, the front line, and they used to have a connection between them. Today, there was some activity in Kapani. They tried to attack us from uh, the left flank, and they gathered some troops in Novoprakopovka to try to counterattack us. But uh, their counterattacks are not really helping them much, and they're failing against the groups that are advancing with the Ukrainian military. And if we go further to the right, there is another area where they got more reinforcements near Priyutne, according to the statements made by their correspondents, 
And some of our sources, uh, please move it more to the right, a little more. There's Briutner there. See here? Just zoom in a little. So that Briutner is right here where you're showing it. It's at one o'clock. And Zavetna Bajanya, the sacred wish uh, settlement, this is right next to the blue protrusion. That's where they managed to actually slow us down and not push us back, but just stop us for a period. And our command, of course, knows that. And that they're trying to cut and attack our troops on the flanks, the ones that are working on the Zavetna Bajanya, and we're taking measures to fortify our flanks. But if you go to the east, they could not stop us there, and uh, we also have uh, bright successes near Marienka and Avdiivka. Remember, we talked last time that these places were not uh, deservedly forgotten in the military news. In Marienka, according to their own statements, they were pushed. And near Avdiivka, if you go a little higher, over here, our troops took Opetne. This is the defense area of the old Donetsk airport. Those who remember the early phases of this war in 2014, this, these people remember that uh, geography. And our troops moved forward, and according to some data, they took half of the settlement. According to other data, they took all of, all of the settlement. And the enemy now is in the southeastern outskirts of that settlement, so everything else is gray zone. And this is a generally good success in that area. They tried to move towards Pirvomaiske, but even there, we, uh, according to their own acknowledgements, we stopped them. If we go to north of Bakhmut, Avdeevka, Klesheevka, Kordumovka, you can see these diamonds in the vertical line on the front, everywhere we are pushing forward. Even uh, Russian correspondents acknowledge that they have to withdraw, that their positions are moving further east. And this map doesn't reflect that motion yet, but I hope tomorrow or in a day uh, it'll start showing it. And further to the north, they're trying to move in the Kupinsk area, Satova and Srebrenska Lesnice, so you can see all these arrows pointing. But as you can see on this uh, front line, there are no changes in its geography, and our troops are rather effectively stopping them there. So, summing it up, Russian command is trying to take measures to stop the motion of our troops in the important areas of the front. There, where our troops may have success and reach the operative freedom, but uh, right now they are failing in doing that for the most part. All right, so Ukrainian intel published that 200 and 60 tanks, 5,000 APCs, 3,000 artillery systems, 500 plus MLRS systems. All these units that they calculate on the Russian side are involved in the action. How do they gather this data? Different measures of intel. For the most part, when you have these large numbers, uh, likely our agents in there command structures of Russian military. So they just gather the data summarily, and sometimes our partners give us some intel. NATO is planning to do the biggest, to conduct the biggest military exercise in the countries of Baltics region, and over 41,000 military will be involved, over 50 naval vessels, uh, 50 ships will be involved. What does it mean that the EU is uh, conducting these exercises? Well, first of all, it means that they stop being shy. Before that, they had to invent different uh, type of fictitious countries, yellow, red, green, other countries as an enemy. Uh, right now, they're actually not shying anything. They're saying that this exercise is training how to defend Europe against Russian aggression. And 40,000, 50 ships, these are super large-scale military exercise. 
and it tells one that the EU really treats the probability of military engagement with Russian Federation as uh, highly probable, and they're not shy to waste money and spend money on that and uh, prepare their troops and try to capitalize on the equipment that Ukraine is acquiring for the whole Europe in this war. And for all the Putin's ultimatums about NATO's uh, influence in Europe, NATO has an answer. And in Russia, they are changing their military district shapes and they're trying to create another army in the St. Petersburg area. But one needs to also understand that modern day Russian army is different from Soviet Union army. Soviet Union army had at least five divisions. Russian army at, at best would have five brigades and they're still calling it an army. And they're failing to acquire right numbers because they all are getting wasted and grinded here in Ukraine on the front. And NATO at the same time, uh, spending all these money for exercise, it's a good signal that NATO stopped uh, saving money on their military preparedness. That's a good signal for us. Another interesting news uh, came from Hungary, where Hungarian Prime Minister Urban came out and said that their nuclear station will be transferred from European supply energy supplies to French energy supplies. Oh, this is a big blow to the Russia. Yeah, as uh, we discussed with Yuri earlier on the phone today, they might actually we might witness the infighting between Russia and Hungary as the result of it. Uh, some statements, and reasonably, were highlighting that today's Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, let's put it delicately, uh, in, was involved in getting some commission from this construction. And there were going to be new blocks constructed by Russian specialists, so there probably was a continuation of that deal. And all of a sudden, they're switching from Russian fuel to the other sources. And that sphere is also, as Russia considers it, uh, to be a direct area of influence. And suddenly it is being taken out of them, from them, and the uh, Hungarian station switching to French fuel. And Russia takes uh, that very pain painfully, and uh, for them nuclear programs is a way to get a foot in the door with any company, its influence, uh, intel, business and other opportunities follow, along with corruption of elites. So it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. We'll see who of them is drama queen. But this is a very serious change of situation on the Hungarian energy market. Change of the fuel provider, I don't even know what to compare that with. It's uh, Imagine that the wife finds that the husband has a permanent lover and a son on the side. Uh, this will not be a quiet divorce. There'll be something, right? So we are at that point. I will add here that dear Ukrainian friends, especially those who live in the Karpatia region and who can speak good Hungarian, please uh, check some of their social media and write a few commentaries there about how Russians see Hungary and the history of Hungary, how they, what they think about 1956 uprising in Hungary that Soviet Union trampled uh, over, how they take uh, the opportunities uh, that Hungarian people took to fight for their language and culture as fascism, and that's what's really written out in modern Russian historical books, uh, history books for, school, for students. So just help Hungarians to see the situation with uh, a realistic sight, same a realistic view, same as Ukrainians uh, are seeing Russia now. Oh, by the way, you can also look deeper into the stopping of uh, Hungarian uprising in the 19th century, in the first half of it, when the uh, Russian Empire was involved in it, and what Russians think about that as well. On the backdrop of war, there was in the news that Annalena Berbok, uh, during her visit to Ukraine, visited one of the energy stations uh, to the north of Kiev, and that station was hit several times by UAVs, Iranian-made UAVs, and she brought up the matter of 
renewables and uh, together with the Ukrainian Ministry of Energy they're having plans about building wind power station in the Chernobyl area. How important do you think that news is for our agenda? Yura, you go ahead, comment on this. I will, I will. Okay, if you strategically look at these things, where is the best place to build a new wind energy station with uh, German technologies and all? Of course, on the border with Belarus, where at any given moment we can have Wagner troops or some Russian troops invading. So what exactly is our Minister of Defense is doing? Probably trying to create uh, some semblance of uh, activity. And since our American partners are asking for resignation of that specific minister uh, due to some corruption issues, he is probably trying to cover his butt and show that, look, we're still doing something. We're doing something fantastic here. But the main question is that all these plans, it's for nothing. Because until we have regulated issues with Russia, even the stupid man would understand that this asset can be captured by Russians at any moment uh, or destroyed by Russians if they decide to venture across the Belarus border. So our Ministry of Energy is either an idiot or I either a corruptoid. Exactly. Um, I think he Yura got an issue with uh, internet connection. Let's hope he jumps back. Alexei, do you want to say something? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's clear now that Yuri performed his karmic duty here and made a statement and after that departed to the better places. Okay, so another polling shows that Ukrainians consider Zelensky to be responsible for corruption issues in the country. And according to that research, only 18% of our citizens disagree with that statement. Do you think it's fair to Zelensky? How do you think? It's not the right formulation. I think the right formulation is that there are some expectations and convictions that the president needs to work with. And one should note, this is after he declared the war on corruption. He understands that his power depends upon the successful fight with corruption. I think if you poll Ukrainians in large, they'll call corruption problem number one and war is problem number two. And that's understandable because our capacity to wage this war successfully directly depends upon the level of corruption. And one needs to understand that you cannot just survive as a government by just campaigning on that. You cannot just put Kolomoisky and maybe uh, somebody else in prison. You need to develop systemic actions here in order to change the minds of people so they can see that this uh, struggle is effective. And this happened according to what we discussed before, that concentration of power in single hands has a very uh, strong backblow because uh, on one hand you have all the praise for all your achievements right and in international arena frontline and everything if you are the boss uh, who has all the power you also are responsible for everything negative so if you are a solemn ruler you take both you take praise and uh, all the attacks on all the stuff or all the mistakes and I wouldn't say this is a catastrophe for our command, but this is a strike on the bell that can actually crack that bell. Because if one to think, just, just to find a way to roll back the 70% opinion that, look, these, uh, our government is actually effectively fighting with corruption, it's a titanic effort for the government to do that. It's one of the most serious challenges for our president that will probably define his whole political destiny looking forward, without, uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Friends, I have not asked you a single time, except for the very beginning of the stream, to please click the like and subscribe buttons on uh, any channel where you're watching it. Um, this is how you can help for these streams to be seen by more eyeballs. Okay, colleagues, one, actually two more important news we want to touch upon today. Alexei, you already mentioned that piece uh, of news again, and I think we should probably discuss it in a little more detail here that strategic way from India to Europe, bypassing Turkey and China. So let's take a look at the map. That's what it looks like. Mumbai, Dubai, Riyadh, Haifa and Piraeus to, in Greece and further to Europe. So can one 
elaborate further in more detail how can this route be possible and what challenges are there. Well, it goes through the biggest ports on this route. The union between Greece, Israel and uh, Cyprus formed itself rather recently when they found some hydrocarbons in the area where they kicked Hezbollah out and agreed with uh, Greece to create the pipeline in order to transfer some of the energy sources to Europe. And they also have their relations with Egypt in a somewhat good spot. They're getting closer with Saudi Arabia, was for nothing as well, was not for nothing as well. And the Americans uh, overall looking at that picture were playing against China because essentially this is a direct alternative to Chinese Silk Road and they're also undercut Turkey. Right, because uh, one matter is that Greeks are part of this project because uh, we know the relations between Turkey and Greece, and Americans are showing it to Turks that they can participate in this uh, route, but they need to work for that. And it's normal for Americans, they usually show the benefits one, two, three, four, five, and then these are the actions one country needs to take in order to be part of this project. And Turkey definitely has a few things to resolve, uh, support to Putin, some grey supplies to Russia, different grey or how they call it in Russia, alternative supplies, uh, supply routes via Turkey. And of course, uh, freedom of speech, uh, human rights, their uh, situation with Kurds and relations with Greece. And one can remember that Americans were actually putting some sanctions on Turkey. And they only recently alleviated them when they came to some agreement about Finland and Sweden joining NATO. So relations between the United States and Turkey are somewhat strained. Erdogan is conducting politics that, uh, according to Americans, uh, goes against American interests in the region. And what the suggestion does, it puts down Turkey and China and elevates India, Saudi Arabia, Greece, Israel. So this is how people who studied in good schools realize their geopolitical aspirations. They work for dozens of years and then come out and change the playing field affecting other major players. When we will learn it as a government, as a country, then perhaps we'll be able to play a bigger role in the world. But this is a serious attack on the Chinese Silk Route and controlling, uh, putting an alternative route to Chinese uh, control of land movement of uh, goods and creating good economic changes in the area. Ukraine can also probably capitalize on this alternative route. And uh, we need first to end this war and then create what Europe probably will name. And right, and create a South Russia state, as we discussed before in several streams on Alpha and Omega. We should understand the logic that Ukraine would need to not only fight for access to Central Asia and Chinese goods as well and Chinese markets and production capabilities, uh, the same areas that uh, other countries are fighting for. But also India is another growing player in that region, not exactly the new uh, one, but uh, India essentially is playing like a new China role for the West. And in this logic, in this view, what's happening between India, Saudi Arabia and Greece is an opportunity to create this new route that will enable that uh, industrial growth and trade. Egypt is also participating in this project and given that Saudi Arabia and their relations uh, with their neighbors are improving, I think uh, it'll be a very viable route. So. Ukraine definitely should be looking for its place in this route and understandably it'll take an effort, it's probably a decade-long project, but regardless the logic that we've been discussing, we actually highlight these news that uh, support this view of the world and Ukraine will be truly independent when it'll have good system of unions with its neighbors, with Turkey, with Central Asia, with Brits, with our immediate neighbors here in the Baltics and also when we'll become new partners in these uh, trade routes that are 
being formed in front of us, in front of our eyes. Okay, great. And one more news uh, that I wanted to ask you to comment just a couple words on about that special operation that military intel personnel conducted recently while when they captured the oil platforms of Boyko, where Russia since uh, 2018 was uh, mining uh, natural gas illegally. Not only gas, right, Nikolai, they also had intel systems set on these uh, platforms and one of these uh, stations was actually captured during the attack and the Russians also had a helicopter pad that they used and they used these uh, objects as uh, part of their defense line for Crimea that they occupied. So we basically returned our own platforms. This is our economic zone. These are the things that Ukraine built. So we're starting to roll back the occupation of Crimea because one can say that that uh, these were captured as the part of the Crimea occupation and now we're starting to roll it back. And how it happened? That was fantastic. When our specialists on speedboats and inflatables are fighting with Su-35 and they're actually launching ground-to-air missiles at uh, Russian jet while heading towards these oil platforms and uh, damaging it somewhat. I don't remember operations like that since the beginning of war. I think it definitely will be a highlight in some of the military practices and proper books and maybe even memes. And it shows that our specialists can conduct the most bold operations. They actually had some Russian personnel on these platforms, which uh, ceased to exist now. So not much, but uh, some people are saying that there was a detachment uh, entrenched there. So these are just versions. But yeah, this is good. This is great news. Yura, would you want to comment on this too? You have another specialist later in your streams today. Uh, yeah, you have a one guest who is uh, going to talk about economic influence. Um, and yeah, it's your own gas production. It's a question number one, natural gas production for Ukraine. This is uh, 100 million cubic meters that these uh, platforms were mining. Um, I think it was more than 1.5 billion. I actually, I think I saw Amin had mentioned that it was 1.5 billion cubic meters. I don't know. I, I think billion may be a little too much of a figure, but uh, even if it's million, that's a huge number. All right. So next uh, story is the continuation of uh, our previous discussions about Germany when there was an attack on a Ukrainian uh, kid by a Russian citizen. And publication on Deutsche Welle clarified today that the version that political aspect of this attack was not uh, confirmed. New data shows that the kid uh, suffered a wound before he uh, was attacked by this Russian citizen and that he wasn't dropped from anywhere in the water. But Alexei, what do you do you have to say anything? I think the end of this formulation says that Indeed, the man attacked the boy by throwing a bottle at him, but they couldn't prove the intent to hurt him. Um, I can say, okay, maybe the boy indeed uh, suffered some wounds before playing earlier in that area, but uh, sorry for going into that detail, but in general, throwing a bottle in a kid, um, this is not good. An attempt to try to code it as a, just a regular criminal thing, not a political I think this is wrong, because when a Russian citizen attacks a Ukrainian kid, that uh, I think should be looked at with more scrutiny. And uh, I hope our Minister of Foreign Affairs pay, pays due attention to this matter. All right, um, we'll keep an eye on this. And I, that's all news, colleagues, that I have. Hang on, I have one more. I have one more. Go ahead, Yura. I want to say... Uh, to the man who is walking near Pechora Market and texting us in the chat that he is going to on the Nimirovich Danchenko Street. 
Uh, thank you for watching us, but also be careful because it is risky to watch streams while you're walking. But thank you for uh, doing that and thank you for being with us. We care about you and other viewers. Thank you all who were with us. And uh, do not forget to subscribe to Alexis' channel, to Yuri's channel, and tell the media, click the like button. Uh, and of course, to the Primateer Station if you are watching that in English. See you guys.